20, three weeks, 21 days, I went all across the country on my way back to San Francisco and we held town halls, not about the politics, not necessarily about the religious aspects of this, but about, but about what was happening mythically. And every time that I would talk about, let's say, the, the threat of terrorism, I would use a mythic image like the Hedra. If you recall the story of the Hedra, no one else can, can conquer it, can kill it, because every time the, the head is cut off, another one grows back. So out of all of those heroes, it's Hercules, Heracles, who's the one who anneals, he tempers his sword, which I thought was a marvelous metaphor. And when he does that, he's finally, he's able to cauterize the, the nine necks of the hedra. And I use it as one of my metaphors for dealing with terrorism and the threats that led to 9-11. So th that 21 days deeply got into me in terms of my teaching and the relevance of myth in the modern world. Um, we take a, a, a pause on that to come forward to two and a half years ago in the depths of the, the pandemic. I, along with most of you, were probably uh, paralyzed with uh, de depression, sadness, uh, and insecurity about the future, what is happening. And then one night I remembered the, the essay that I had written about Sisyphus and creativity, how the myth can act both as a cautionary tale, but also as a wonderful metaphor for creativity itself. Either you learn to love the life of repetition, doing something again and again and again until you get it right, or you are horrified by the repetition and it can feel like a punishment. This is Sisyphean territory here that hit me because I realized uh, I hadn't been writing. It was very difficult to write in the first few months of the pandemic. And then I decided to plunge back into the book and spent the next several months writing this. Well, how, was, how was that inspired? I remembered uh, an event when I took one of my groups to Corinth which is where, again, Sisyphus is, was king, and we will show all this with some slides in a few minutes. This was about 2010. And when my group arrived, we stood outside the wonderful ruins of the Temple of Apollo and looked up at the, the mighty uh, Acro Corinth, an enormous uh, mini mountain, if you will, which was the site of most of the citadels of uh, ancient Greece, Mycenaean Greece. The citadels were up there for protection and, for, and so on. And as I told the story of Sisyphus as king, I noticed that it really seized the imagination of the group as I was starting to say, what is your stone? If you can't name your boulder, it will have power over you. This is part of the message of the great Sisyphus myth. What is your boulder? What is your stone? What is your mountain? Is it marriage? Is it work? Is it devotion? Is it your relationship to God or the gods? Everybody has a boulder. Everybody has a burden. And it's either a task or it's a challenge of some kind. So this is a very shorthand for what we will explore in the next uh, couple hours. At the end of the talk, I watched as my group dispersed, several people still telling notes. I said, go, 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 go get some water. It's very hot out here. That will be part of, in a major part of our story. And then I noticed over, uh, as I was walking back to the, the coach, I noticed a beautiful, probably a 2000 year old olive tree. And at the base of the tree was an old journal, a weather worn leather journal without thinking about it, an, an idea, an image, a voice bladed into me that Sisyphus had left this journal behind. I know it sounds irrational. <laughs> it sounds a little silly, but as poets, painters, filmmakers, musicians will tell you, <laughs> never say no to that first image, especially if it's numinous which if some of you know, I will be using a lot of wordplay here. And I remember Jim Hillman once telling me that the 
etymology of, of numinous is numen, which originally meant the nod of the gods. Isn't that marvelous? This is a little beyond sacred. The word is sometimes used interchangeably, but I don't use it that way. I use it when there's an event that seems to say that one of the gods or the goddesses is, is in the room, suddenly filling the room and your soul with a tremendous psychic force, tremendous energy. So at that moment, I took that seriously. Sisyphus could have left his journal behind and the seed for this book was planted. Um, the great poet Robert Lowell, who I believe won four Pulitzers for his poetry, uh, and including his translation, by the way, of Prometheus. His modern translation is one of our finest. And that story will also be wrapped up into our tale about Sisyphus today. Uh, he, he had once said, one of the lines in one of his last books, Life Studies, was, I am hell. Not, I feel like hell. Not, I'm traversing hell. Remember, he had 27 electroshock therapy sessions. And he was going in and out of psychosis his entire life. And the chant and what he had to do when he had moments of lucidity was, as he said, and here's the first of my many baseball images, you have to catch the image. Which is something as a baseball nut, I, I love that image. We'll talk, be talking a lot about throwing and catching. You have to catch the image. And this was my image, which in a which came back to me sitting on my couch in the, in the early months of the pandemic, which helped ignite my passion, because this is what passion and complex is, right, this whole week. This is what lit mine, because I suddenly reconnected with Sisyphus's own passion. And that's what I want to, to talk about today. The, uh, as I began to write, of course, many memories of Camus, the different images, uh, editions of the myth of Sisyphus, which I learned about when I was living in Paris, a uh, writer in residence at Shakespeare and Company for seven months. This was uh, an enormous break for me. And it was through the, the legendary owner, George Whitman, that I learned as he, he knew I was writing about myths and so on. He loved my work with Campbell. And he said, you need to read Camus' essay. So I went down just across the street to one of the Bucadiste stands. Remember those are the, those marvelous, uh, sometimes metal, sometimes wooden book containers along the Seine. This is where, by the way, our own Library of Congress started. Thomas Jefferson himself walked along the Seine and bought hundreds and hundreds of books from the old Bucanistes. And that became this, the core collection of our Library of Congress. But that's where I found the French edition of the myth of Sisyphus. And it is the, the last line of that that I read the night when I decided that I had to tackle this. One must or we must imagine Sisyphus happy. So in a kind of uh, back engineering, as some inventors might call it, that one line so riveted me, I had to ask myself a question in two ways. One, what drove Camus to look at this story in this sense? But also previously, what was it about this story that was told and then retold and then rejuvenated, reinterpreted, reinterpreted many, many times through, from classical times to Hellenistic times, the myth is transformed, <clears throat> sometimes transmogrified many times. <clears throat> and I want to argue to fit the times. This is one of the functions of myths. Myths are protean. If the myth isn't talking to the, the people, to the collective, to the cultural moment, it will change or it will disappear. Like it was, myths are deciduous, like the leaves that drop off of a tree. <clears throat> so that was a huge breakthrough for me to read Camus there. I began to identify very much with his reading of the story. Uh, and with one proviso here, just so you know that 
Camus' four-page essay, which has fueled <clears throat> so much psychoanalysis, uh, so many movements, uh, whole conferences just itself, was written in a few days in a in a what do they call it a, 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 a climb up apartment in the Latin Quarter in Paris, 1941, when when Camus was not escaping Paris because of the Nazi occupation, he was one of the heads of the French resistance. So do you feel the metaphor coming on here? He is looking for a way to help inspire the members of the resistance who are dying every day. And then they have to replenish the forces. And there's this sense of, of futility. Uh, when or will the Nazis ever leave? It must have come to him in some way that this was a Sisyphean task to try to constantly climb this mountain. The mountain of what? The mountain of freedom, the mountain of independence. So he writes this essay, which if you know how to read it metaphorically, is about the injustice of the world. It's about resistance against evil. It's about a life of constant repetition. And then as he says, and I will read the whole passage at the end of this presentation, we have to think of him as happy. This is where I want to go with the general uh, direction 